Thanks. Hello, everybody. Uh, thank you, uh, AMLD and uh, track organizers, for the invitation. My name is uh, Pierre Sagon, and I will, uh, I'm a data scientist working for Electricity Map. And I'm going to give you some insights into how we use machine learning within Electricity Map to help drive the transition towards a truly decarbonized electricity system. Uh, but first off, I will start by explaining what Electricity Map is and uh, why it was created, because it's very important to the whole uh, narrative. So first, uh, well, I'm not going to teach you anything by saying that climate change is uh, one of the biggest challenges that we're facing, and that it's mostly uh, the result of us burning a lot of fossil fuels um, to power our society. Um, and if we want to stop climate change, we know that we have to stop burning these fossil fuels. Um, and it's not easy. <laughs> it's not easy because, as you can see on this, uh, on this chart, Currently, there's about 80% of our entire energy supply that is coming from burning fossil fuels. And uh, energy is basically what powers any work that we can do. So it's very fundamental to the way we grow food, uh, heat our homes, or generate uh, goods and services that we consume every day. So if we want to get rid of all these fossil fuels, it kind of means uh, that we have to reinvent 80% of the way we live our lives. Uh, but we often serve this, uh, this narrative um, that the, the easy solution forward is just to electrify everything. And I'm not going to say it's a bad idea, it's a good idea, but uh, it has to be done in the correct way in, with clean electricity. Uh, and it's not necessarily the case uh, at all times. Uh, a picture can be worth a thousand words. This is currently the biggest machine that humans have ever created, which is a coal excavator that is used to this day in Germany to, to extract a lot of coal that is then burnt and releases a lot of CO2 in the atmosphere. Uh, so that's why Electricity Map was created, basically, to uh, create the information layer to drive the transition uh, towards the decarb uh, decarbonization of electricity systems. Uh, and what we do in practice is that we map the uh, carbon emissions of electricity consumption uh, and generation in real time uh, on an hourly base. And I'm just going to give you a very uh, short demo so it becomes a bit clearer. So if we go here to, uh, so this is the map. If we go to Switzerland, we can see that currently a lot of the power that, we, uh, that Switzerland is consuming is produced by nuclear, a bit of hydro, uh, and then it relies also on imports from Austria and Germany. And with all of that data, we're able to compute that little number uh, that gives how clean the electricity is on the Swiss grid at this, uh, at this moment. Up. So now that we have a better understanding of what uh, electricity map is, I'm just going to give a few insights into how, uh, how uh, within electricity map we use machine learning to, uh, to achieve our, our vision. So first off, if we were to draw an analog analogy uh, and say that we organize uh, decarboni uh, decarbonization initiatives on a ladder uh, in terms of uh, complexity and how much reliant they are on machine learning, the first step on that ladder would be uh, granular carbon accounting. So basically, as we integrate more and more renewables in our electricity grids, it creates an inherent variation in the carbon intensity of the electricity on the grid. And you can see here, uh, with this carbon heat clock that is provided by Google, uh, a visualization of that variability. You can see that at the end of the day, here uh, in North Carolina in September, there was not, there was almost no uh, carbon-free electricity on the grid. But uh, at noon, when the sun was shining, uh, the grid was almost completely powered by uh, clean electricity. So this creates a real need to do uh, accounting of carbon emissions on an hourly basis. And this is where Electricity Map comes in, that can provide the hourly uh, carbon intensity uh, figures that are, that are needed. Uh, in practice, we work with so big, uh, big customers like Google and Microsoft and others, uh, and they have a requirement for having data for every hour of the year. But the problem is that the data sources that we rely on sometimes go out. Uh, so we have to build models, machine learning models, 
that do uh, compute estimates for these carbon uh, emission figures when there's no data available. So we have uh, gap filling algorithms that uh, basically use the periodicity of the, the electricity grid to compute weighted averages using like the same time of the day uh, from weeks, months, and years apart to, to, uh, to estimate what uh, the carbon intensity of a missing daytime would be. And, you know, and because uh, our customers also have a, a global coverage, there's a need to uh, generate these hourly uh, figures and data for places in the world where that data just doesn't exist. And so this is an example of what we did in Korea. Uh, we were able to, to gather some aggregate monthly uh, data that was broken down into production mixes uh, and some hourly but very lagged uh, data to train a model that would generate hourly estimates for the production mix uh, in Korea. And now you can see on the map that what is the estimated uh, production mix in Korea at all times. And typically we see through these partnerships that, uh, that granular carbon accounting uh, unlocks interesting pathways for emission reductions. Uh, this is, for example, the carbon footprint tool that is now available on uh, Google Cloud, which uh, provides estimates of uh, the carbon emissions related to cloud usage to all of the users of Google Cloud. And this is actually uh, the carbon footprint of running electricity map on Google Cloud. And we use that to, uh, to pick the data centers and regions in the world that are the cleanest, and also the technologies that are the cleanest to reduce the overall uh, carbon impact of, uh, of, have, of running an electricity map. So if we go up the ladder now, uh, on the second rug, we would find the uh, demand side response, which is a bit more complicated. But the idea here is to use forecasted uh, carbon intensity signal uh, to dictate what should be the consumption behavior of electricity intensive uh, applications. And we do this basically yeah, by predicting in the next 48 hours what the carbon intensity is going to be uh, in a bunch of different zones in the world. And uh, the way we do this is by, uh, for a given zone, we would look at weather features uh, that we would complement with uh, autoregressive features and seasonal features. And we would concatenate that with uh, these same features, but for all the zones neighboring it, et cetera, et cetera, and pass this through a, a regularized linear model that selects the best features to then predict uh, the next 48 hours of carbon intensity in a given zone. And this has very interesting applications. Uh, as uh, Google is using this to shift the load on their data centers. So as you can see here, the green line is the carbon optimized load that they do, uh, and you can see that the load reduces in the middle of the day if the carbon intensity is the highest, and they shift that consumption uh, to other times where electricity is greener, which has uh, huge uh, saving potential. And we also provide these kind of smart uh, adaptation of behavior for individual consumers. So you can see on the left, this is the, oh, sorry, the, um, the app of uh, CAS and VA is like uh, one of the main, main the Danish uh, electricity providers, and they provide to their customers uh, a forecast of what the consumption mix will be, so that individuals can also adapt their behavior in their homes. Uh, most importantly, the next version of Windows will most likely also use our data to uh, update automatically at times where electricity is the greenest for where the computer is located. And we envision that in the future, this kind of smart uh, behavior will also be adopted for the charging of electric cars and for running uh, automatically like electricity intensive uh, appliances. And finally, on the last rung of the ladder, which is still something that is a bit, uh, that is not functional, but inspirational rather, is assessing uh, the impact of large scale decarbonation projects uh, using long term marginal emission factors. Uh, so basically, this the idea here is to, to train a, a machine learning model that would be able to predict where and where uh, is, is it optimal to install a new wind power farm, for example, and what the impact of that would be. Uh, and I'm mentioning this because we currently have some linear models that do uh, generate 
short-term marginal emission factors, which answer the same question, but with the strong assumption that the grid configuration doesn't change. Uh, and we've also seen uh, recent papers that are, that are supporting that, that claim. I think I'm running out of time, so that's, that's it for, for today. Uh, thank, thanks a lot for, for your attention. And just a quick self-promotion, we are hiring. <laughs> and uh, we also have an open source repository where people, hundreds of contributors from all around the world, help us increase our coverage and the precision of the data we, yeah, we provide. Thank you.